somebody listening to it tonight. In your name, Jesus, move in a mighty way, Lord, on each and every person. Touch their hearts. Let them see what you want them to see. Let them hear what you want them to do. In your name, amen. Glory. And last week, we were working on the uh, death of Jesus Christ. The, uh, of course, this is Jesus on the cross. And uh, the Bible states that when he finally died, that uh, he actually died before the, uh, the other two thieves. And the other two thieves were on each side of them. They came and they broke their bones, but they didn't break Jesus' legs. But it's interesting that what they did is they put a spear into his side and blood and water came out. That's very significant because uh, Adam, when uh, Eve came from his side, and the church actually came from the side of Jesus when he was on the cross because it was the beginning of the church. And uh, we look at the fact that blood and water uh, in, in baptism, that has to mix, uh, both of those. And it, he was baptized, and he's telling us, all of us have to get baptized because blood and water have to mix. And he'll say, well, how does blood and water mix in baptism? Well, if we are baptized the Bible way, which is in the name of Jesus Christ, his name is applied to our lives, meaning that the blood is in the name. And when we are baptized in his name, I more or less become, when I got baptized, I became Roger Skwazacic, Jesus. And I got into the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Spiritually, I'm connected all the way back through David and back into Abraham. Uh, we become spiritual Jews. But blood and water are mixed when we take on the name of Jesus in baptism. There are some people that are baptized using titles, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The name is never mentioned. Uh, they miss out on getting the name applied to their life. And you say, well, God's gonna do that anyway. Well, God tells us how to do things and we have no right to change the way that he has laid down for us to do it. So uh, we're gonna move forward here. We're gonna see some of these different things as we go along, but uh, <coughs> The first thing here is we're looking at the fact that uh, he had the spear and blood and water came out. Now, he was the Passover lamb. And at the Passover, Josephus said in his writings that uh, the one he witnessed, there was 250,000 lambs that were slain. Can you imagine the blood? And they, they have at the temple, there was drains that drained down into a place called Gehenna. It was a valley and actually it was a type of hell because it was really a garbage dump and, and the blood would all flow down there. But it's, this was the Passover lamb would always take away the sins. It would remove the sins for one year until Jesus himself died on the cross as a Passover lamb. He did it once and for all and there was no need for any more sacrifices. So this blood all flowed down into this valley. But after the sacrifices were done, to show that everything had been accomplished the way God wanted it to be accomplished, they poured water down these drains. And all the water finally gets all the blood out of the drain and all goes down into that valley of Gehenna. Now, uh, again, we look at uh, blood and water. He had drained all the blood. I mean, he had no more blood and water came out. He was here, the Bible was stating, this is just one more evidence of death. The centurion, his main job was to make sure that whoever was died on the cross truly was dead. And of course, that's why they were examining him and, uh, and he was already dead and so they did a spear just to make sure and then blood and water came out. So there was that additional surety there. Mm -hmm. But uh, the centurion had a report back to uh, Pilate that mission accomplished, he's dead. So uh, we're looking here at, uh, again, when Jesus was on the cross, he's marred more than any man. Uh, last week I showed the picture of 
a, a flaming cross. And of course, I have Zechariah 13, 7 here, but uh, I started out with uh, Genesis 3, 24. It talked about Adam and Eve were put out of the Garden of Eden, and at the east end of Eden, there was cherubim, probably about four, could have been, uh, I'd say there's always four angels around God throughout the Old Testament and even around the throne in, in Revelation chapter four. So there's probably four cherubim there. But it says, but there was also a sword, a flaming sword that went in every direction. And of course, when Jesus died on the cross, the, there was actually, this isn't a, a total correct drawing because there was cherubim, there was angels on the veil here. And when the veil was rent from the top to the bottom, man would have done it from bottom to top, but this was top to bottom. The veil was rent. God was saying that I've opened the way for you now and the cherubim are taken out of the way. But how about the flaming sword? Well, Zechariah 13, seven says, awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. And uh, this is actually a, a, a quote from, let me see, it's uh, Philip's commentary, but he says something very interesting here, a flaming sword, a fitting symbol of God's wrath against sin, a flaming sword to be sheathed and staked at the lost in the heart of the woman's seed. And he was saying that Jesus took that flaming sword within him. And of course, last week I talked about the fact that in some chiropractors will, will say this, that there's a certain pain in the back that it's like you, you take a poker and you heat it in the uh, flames until it's red hot and you stick it in the back and that's what that pain feels like. This is, he took the flaming sword. He took our wrath upon him. And of course, I went into the details. He took our hell upon him. From 12 o'clock till three o'clock, the sun quit shining. There was darkness. Uh, several scriptures talk about that. One in Amos, there's one in, I'm not sure two gospels speak of it. But the point is, uh, he was in our hell. He could hear the screaming, it was darkness. Uh, they probably had torches, but they were given no light. He probably looked down at the temple. They were north of the temple, and they looked down there, and in the brazen altar, flame was coming up from that, but it wasn't giving off any light uh, because at 3 o'clock, they had to kill the Passover lamb. Jesus was going to die at 3 o'clock. For three hours, he took our hell. Every sin, every spirit that... Uh, goes with any sin, he took that upon himself. The Bible says his visage was marred more than any man. I always wonder, well, how could his visage be marred more? Because other people have been crucified and they've gone through the, uh, the beating with the whip and being hit. I mean, that was just a, a regular game with the Romans uh, taking someone through all that. But it went further than that. Why would the centurion, why would the centurion when the only one, the other say, truly, this was the Son of God. They saw things happening here that never before. They knew that the, uh, what they had just witnessed was beyond anything they had ever seen. So again, this is Jesus on the cross. And uh, I want to just bring out a, a few things here too that, uh, first of all, I mentioned last week, and I went through the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. And of course, between 12 and 3, he says, uh, why hast thou forsaken me? And then the second one, he says, I thirst. And then he says, it is finished. And of course, when he says, it is finished, he wasn't capable. He, he was just about dead. But with a loud voice, he goes, it is finished. And of course, as a young boy, he says, I must be about my father's business. And, and of course, at this point, it is finished. He accomplished the mission. It was a victory call. Between 12 and three, it was light fighting against darkness. And 
at three o'clock when he died, there was victory. Now, let me just kind of go over some of these uh, miracles here because uh, I mentioned some of the last week, but I want to show there were seven miracles uh, from his arrest in the garden up until the time of just uh, prior to his burial. Uh, one was soldiers fell backward when Jesus says, I am he. Uh, in the garden of Gethsemane, the soldiers came up and he says, where is he? And he says, I am he. And immediately every soldier fell backwards. You can read about that in John 18, 6. John's a tremendous gospel to read because he mentions things that Matthew, Mark, Luke don't talk about. John talks about Jesus as being God. And he catches these little things. All the soldiers fell backwards at that point. That's powerful. We used to do that in our Messiah. And preachers would come, what in the world is going on here? And they start reading the scriptures. It was there all the time. Why didn't we ever see that before? You know, <laughs> and it's, it's powerful. The, uh, the next thing was the soldier's ear was cut off and Jesus put the ear back on. Uh, darkness covered the earth and that was from 12 o'clock to three o'clock. No clouds were mentioned, no rain, no, no storm, but the sun, it says the sun stopped shining. Talk about a miracle. And it wasn't a, uh, what do you call it when the moon? Um, eclipse. Eclipse. It wasn't an eclipse because an eclipse may last 15, 20 minutes at the most. This was three hours. So uh, again, it was miraculous. And of course it was Amos 8, 9 and 10, Matthew 27, 45, 46, and Mark 15, 33. Those are the scriptures that talk about that. Uh, Amos talks about he would turn uh, the feast into mourning. Uh, it was a Passover <coughs> feast. It was the first feast of the year. It was a, a powerful feast for them. Everybody had to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. And he says, uh, he, God would turn that feast into mourning. Of course, Jesus was on the cross. Uh, the next thing, there was an earthquake. Uh, and then the rocks were split. It was really at the time that he died. Immediately, an earthquake, rocks were split. Can you imagine? Rocks just bam, 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 busting apart. And, and again, I mentioned last week, and I love the way that Max Lucado said, uh, he died and he was just waiting to go down to Abraham's bosom to release the people that were down there, Abraham and all of them. And, and he says, I could just see Jesus charging down there. Get out of the way, rocks. Earthquake. And bam, bam, bam. And, but he went down to Abraham's bosom and brought them up to paradise. And that's why the thief was with him. And he was able to go up uh, with him. But the Bible says they did not come immediately out of the graves. Jesus had to be the first fruit of the resurrection. He came up first and then the others came up behind. We'll get that in a minute. The veil of the temple was rent. And of course, many people said that it was uh, uh, so thick, attractors couldn't pull it apart. Uh, no one has ever found any evidence for that, that it was that thick. Uh, you can't find it in, uh, anywhere. And it's not in the Bible. If someone came up with, oh, it had to be thick, you know, God had to do that. Well, the uh, veil of the temple represented Jesus' skin. <coughs> And I don't think he was thick-skinned, okay? <laughs> and it talks about it as being a light veil. And so I'm just stating that. And, you know, we, we need to look at the Bible and what's the Bible saying and try to stick with the Bible. But again, <clears throat> it was rent from top. And that's a miracle in itself. It's rent from top to bottom. It was God did this. And you imagine the high priest, oh, you know, just seeing this happen. Of course, what was on the inside, what was in the holiest of holies? The Ark of the Covenant had been gone since the days of Jeremiah. There was no Ark of the Covenant there. There was just the rock in there. Mm -hmm. And chances are it was the rock that is now in the Mosque of Omar, which is the Arab temple that has been put on top of the um, Mount Moriah, because that's where Abraham was going to kill Isaac, but the Arabs say that was where Abraham was going to kill Ishmael. Uh, <laughs> interesting and that was that's probably that rock but it's not one the ark of the covenant of course 
Judas went out and hung himself. Uh, terrible life because uh, you can see through the scriptures, Jesus reached for him many, many times. In the process of working with Messiah, I've, I've had to study this out for the, that purpose. And it's really interesting. I mean, he even called him a thief at one time. He, he knew that Judas was stealing money out of their, their uh, he, he was the treasurer uh, of the 12. And he was stealing money out of it and kind of putting stuff back that, uh, to build his little kingdom somewhere. But uh, he had many chances, and it even came to the end where it says he repented. But then he went out and hung himself. He committed suicide. So close. Even he repented, but then he lost hope in him again and killed himself. So that was sad in that respect. Now, um, we're looking at the resurrection. Uh, and <clears throat> let me just say that there's seven miracles that happen with the resurrection. I, I just want to quickly go through those. Um, let me see. I thought I had the seven miracles here, but here they are. Okay, number one, another earthquake. This was Jesus was going to come out of the tomb. There was an earthquake, and then it was after this that he resurrected. Uh, his grave was opened by an angel, yeah. it states. A visible angel opened the door of the tomb, uh, not to let Jesus out, but to show the disciples the tomb was empty. Jesus rose from the dead and came out of the grave. So uh, here's another miracle. He rose from the dead. No other prophet or small g God has ever rose from the dead. Uh, I mean, you go Muhammad and... Uh, Joseph Smith and, and name all the false gods of all the Eastern religions, uh, they all stayed in the grave. But Jesus is the only one that ever came out of the grave. And if he didn't come out of the grave, we would have nothing. But he came out of the grave showing us, I'm real. And then there's something else because the next miracle is he was the first fruits. All these people come out after him and it says, they were seen uh, going to the uh, uh, holy city, okay? They were probably going up to Jerusalem, holy uh, city of Jerusalem. But you, you look at this. The body says they came out in body form. I was always thought they'd come out in spirit form, but no, they came out in body form. To me, that is one of the greatest scriptures that tell us that if we die, we're going to live again. And we're either going to... We have an eternity in heaven or we have an eternity in hell. There's only two places after that. But that's a powerful scripture that we will live again. The Sadducees didn't believe that there was going to be a resurrection. And when Jesus rose from the dead, don't you know that messed up their theology? <laughs> uh, so the Pharisees did believe there was a resurrection. But again, that was another miracle. The... Uh, now, here's something that's very interesting, too, that his grave clothes were undisturbed. And this other Search for Truth chart has a very interesting picture here. Notice, when they looked inside, this is what they saw. It, it was, when they were burying someone, they had to wrap them and wrap them with all this um, uh, strips of uh, linen cloth. And then they had to put, it was like a glue, but it was, uh, and then they put all myrrh and uh, uh, all these burial spices in. And they says it, it probably, the whole thing probably weighed about 100 pounds when they, they got done. But when they looked inside, it was like a cocoon that there was nothing in it. And when Peter saw that, he knew Jesus had rose again. That was the evidence that he had. And of course, uh, I think it's John 20, 12. I'll have to, John 20, 12. Uh, someone read that for me? I just want to, 
Notice that there's an angel there. And, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, for the body of Jesus had lain. Okay, so there was two angels, one at the head and one at the feet where Jesus had lain. Hmm. Sounds like the Ark of the Covenant, doesn't it? <laughs> two angels and the mercy seat and, and uh, actually the, the box below is sometimes called a coffin or a, uh, another name for it, I can't think, but yeah, the Ark of the Covenant. That's, that's a beautiful picture, it's a powerful picture, and I'm glad that they drew that because it says a lot, and our God is alive. Now, one more here is, uh, he ascended up into heaven. So seven miracles after. Now, uh, there was, um, I'm going to just look at something here. <clears throat> he was laying down his plan of salvation. And every person, and you could tell that, I mean, the way he died, he meant business with this plan of salvation. He didn't, he wasn't dying for something he wanted anybody to take lightly. It meant life and death. And he laid down a plan of salvation. We have got to obey that plan of salvation. Uh, every man must take a personal choice to serve Jesus. Listen to this. 5,000 people were with him at a church picnic. After, actually, you could figure it out that there was more than 5,000 because it only counted the men. Mm -hmm. To count the women and children, probably been about 15,000. Uh, 500 were with him when he preached. 500, the Bible states that when he rose from the dead, that 500 people witnessed his resurrection. The um, 120 were with him at a prayer meeting. 70 witnesses went out two by two. 12 walked with him. Three went out of the way with him at Gethsemane. Only one viewed him from short distance at Calvary. Where do you stand? The, uh, for 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus appeared in bodily form many times to 500 people, and you can read about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. 500 witnesses, he came out of the tomb, he was alive, and he defeated death. The resurrection is important because it constitutes the basic difference between the truth and all other non-Christian religions. And of course, Confucius, Muhammad, Buddha, all died and strayed in the grave. grave. Our God is alive. We thank, so thankful that we are worshiping the one true God. Now, we look at the fact that uh, there's one other aspect here that I want to show, and that is this right here. Uh, there are three main feasts of the Lord, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Tenth Day, or the uh, Day of Atonement. Now, all of these feasts can be seen in his death uh, and resurrection. Now, uh, let me explain a few things here. Well, first of all, there was one sign that people were going to give uh, the Pharisees, give us a sign that uh, you, you rise again. And he says, I'll give you one sign. And he says, I will be... Uh, the belly of the whale. Pardon? The belly of the whale. I can't hear you. The belly of the whale. Yeah. <laughs> he says, I'll be as Jonah. I'll be uh, three days and three nights in death. Okay? At the belly of the whale, just like Jonah. Three days and three nights. So first of all, we see that Jesus, uh, what day did he die? Okay, third, first, no, Wednesday. Okay, what day? He rose on Sabbath. Yeah, Sabbath. Yeah, Sunday. He rose on Saturday. Yeah, no, we rose on Sunday. And we all get confused with that was Wednesday, but really it's a Thursday. Okay. Am I going to make me up? Are y'all agreeing with that? I do. Maybe it's 
I said in the Bible study before. Well, yeah. well, what's Good Friday then? It's a day that we like to make up because we're married. <laughs> Well, Good Friday. He dies on Good Friday. He died at 3 o'clock. So uh, 3 o'clock till Saturday would be one day. 3 o'clock till uh, Sunday, after, that would be two days. But he, he, he rose in the morning, so a day and a half. And he says, I will give you one sign. I will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. What happened? What do you mean what happened? He testified to the saints. Pardon? Did he testify to the saints? Or? Well, no, that was, yeah, he, he went down there and he was in the abode, uh, Abraham's bosom, yes. But the, the point is, uh, did he stay in the grave three days and three nights? Uh, we know he came up, it was Sunday, okay? So you go three days back, what would that be? Uh, Sunday, Saturday, Friday, Thursday, okay? But if he died on 3 o'clock Thursday, you're still not getting three full days that way, so you've got to back up to Wednesday, okay? And he died at 3 o'clock, and he had to be in the grave before um, 6 o'clock. Why? Because that's the, Jewish, that's the end of the Jewish day. Okay. 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 Well, that's another thing here. Uh, the Jews start the next day at six o'clock at night. They've always done that. Goes back into Genesis. That when we were over in Israel, and especially you know for the Sabbath day, it started on a Friday night, and all the good food was taken away, and you had to eat all this kosher stuff. And it was a rough day to get through. But especially when you're on a vacation. But nevertheless, uh, 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 it was at. Uh, six o'clock the next night that the next day began. So what we have here is we have uh, the Passover. Jesus dies at three, he's a Passover lamb, but the next feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread that is so combined with the Passover that some people speak of Passover and Unleavened Bread as the same thing. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread required seven days of repentance before they even got to it. In fact, there had to be several weeks of preparation. Their houses had to be cleaned. Any unleavened bread had to be removed from the house. They'd have the kids searching for it, and if they found it, they had to take it out, put it in a bag, and they went and had it burned somewhere. Anyway, because unleavened bread is sin. It's a typology of sin. So what we have here is that the next day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it starts with a Sabbath day. There was other Sabbath days besides Saturday. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread had one of these days. It would have been Thursday. And this is why they had to get him on the, off the cross and buried before Thursday came into being. So, uh, and actually, he did not get totally buried until Thursday because it was uh, during the feast, during that Sabbath day, that the high priest, uh, which they should have never done, but they were trying to protect themselves and keep face with the nation. But they went to Pilate and says, you need to put guards and you need to seal that grave. So at that point on Thursday, they went out and they put guards and they sealed the grave. So uh, that completed the burial process. And... That's why on Sunday they says, this is the third day. Well, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, this, this would have been the third day from Thursday, you know, in speaking of the regarding that. But in reality, uh, there had to be three days and three nights that he was in the heart of the earth. But uh, the reason why is the Passover is connected with the unleavened bread. And that was a seven-day feast that ended on Sunday. And it was the Feast of First Fruits. Jesus came out of the grave. He was the Feast of First Fruits. So uh, he took, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there's three uh, loaves of bread, and one is hidden, and it's finally found. Well, uh, that was him, okay? And it represented the nation, but uh, again, it was telling us that uh, he was accomplishing all these when he died on the cross. So let me just show you... A, the tabernacle plan here. 
at the brazen altar. He died. He was the Passover lamb. That was the unleavened bread because it dealt with sin and repentance. Death had to take place. And then the resurrection, of course, when he rose again, uh, that was the Feast of First Fruits. The next feast was the Feast of Pentecost. And that's where the veil of the temple was rent. When the veil of the temple was rent, uh, it's interesting that over the veil <coughs> are 50 patches that are holding the, actually there's curtains that are the ceiling of the uh, tabernacle. And in that one spot over the veil, they have 50 patches. They don't touch the veil, but there's 50 patches there. And of course, what it does, it's a, a typology that the veil connects with the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50 days after the resurrection. And uh, the Feast of Pentecost, of course, as we know it, was symbolic of the fact that every year they celebrated, this was the giving of law on Mount Sinai. Every year after that, they celebrated the giving of the law with the Feast of Pentecost. So it was at the Feast of Pentecost that uh, uh, God poured out His Spirit. They received the Holy Ghost, spoke in tongues. So uh, again, that's very important in the fact that uh, it was at the bell here. Now, we look at the final phase here, the Day of Atonement and the Tabernacles. Um, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, they had... Uh, branches that were, they were putting down willow and um, there was three different kinds but you don't have these branches on the Feast of Pentecost. These branches were used for the Feast of Tabernacles and they put them down and were waving them. Uh, uh, they were putting uh, what it coats and everything in his way and he's the king, uh, King David and uh, <coughs> actually it was representative of the Feast of Tabernacles because that was taking place at this time. And then, of course, we know that when he died, uh, he accomplished the Feast of the Atonement. Now, remember this, for 364 days a year, the high priest was dressed like this. All these things on the ephod, the girdle, the mitre, the uh, golden crown, the blue coat, the white coat, uh, this and the golden bells and pomegranates. This was his regular dress. He would go in at nine o'clock in the morning for the morning feast and the evening feast at three o'clock in the afternoon. And of course, Jesus died at, uh, put on the cross at nine o'clock. Did I say that right? Okay, he, he went on the cross at nine o'clock at three o'clock in the afternoon, he died. So he was commemorating those, but on the day of atonement, one day a year, the high priest would take off all these vestments. He would have a white coat on. That's why Jesus had a white coat when he went to the cross. The blue, or excuse me, purple, scarlet uh, robe was taken off of him. It was, it was actually uh, <laughs> jerked away from him because they had to put his clothes back on. It was a white coat. The only ones that wore white coats were the priest. He had to be a priest at the cross when he was at the base of, uh, when he was on the cross at his base where the, the soldiers, and they says, we can't rip this apart. Let's go ahead and, and uh, what do you call it? Cast, Cast lots for it. And, but if they had torn it apart, he would have lost his priesthood. Uh, the priest, it was required that they have a hat and that they have their vestments untorn, unripped, okay? So Jesus, his vestments were okay, and the king put a crown on his head. He had a hat. So uh, he was a high priest at the cross. Now, we look at this, and for the atonement, the high priest, uh, you can read in Leviticus chapter 16 all the details of this, but the high priest would be dressed like this, and notice that he goes before the Ark of the Covenant. He has two handfuls of incense, and he has a censer. And he carries all that into the, before the Ark of the Covenant, and he puts the incense on the censer, and a cloud of incense has to come up to cover the 
uh, mercy seat, if he should see the mercy seats when the presence of God comes in there, he would die. He's got to make sure that's covered. Then he would go out and he'd get a, a, a oxen, a calf, and he would get the blood and he would come in, he'd go around the curtain, he'd sprinkle seven times uh, on the, uh, well, sprinkle on the mercy seat and then at the base of the mercy seat. And then he'd go around, he'd sprinkle on the altar of incense. Uh, uh, he'd go out, he'd get the goat's blood, he'd come back in. He'd sprinkle seven times and seven times on the incense, go out, and then he'd go back in, pick up the censer, and go out. So this was all on the Day of Atonement. Jesus accomplished this, but blood had to be put on the mercy seat. How was that possible? In, I think it's John, uh, Romans 3, 5 or 20, 25, but it says, he, Jesus is the propitiation, okay? Uh, he's the mercy seat. Jesus, when he died on the cross, his blood spilled over the mercy seat. He had put the blood on the mercy seat. He had accomplished the atonement with his own blood on the mercy seat. You know, you start putting all these things together and it is so powerful. So, um, again, I just wanted to bring that thought before you on how he accomplished each of these. All these, in fact, when I, I put this chart together, it says something else too because these are historically fulfilled up to here. These aren't fulfilled historically because it has to do with the second coming. And once the rapture takes place, well, then we look for these to be accomplished historically for the sake of the Jews, because he's going to turn back and look to the Jews one last time in the book of Revelation. And uh, he's going to give them, in, uh, I think it's uh, Hosea, he says, uh, uh, I turned my back on you for 2,000 years, but I actually said two days, which means 2,000 years, but he says, I'm turning back and looking at you again. And of course, it's talking about the fact that he's going to give them one more opportunity in the Revelation. Gentiles will have had their chance, but now the Jews will get one more opportunity. Only a lot of Jews are going to be killed, but a remnant will go into the millennial and uh, be a part of Jesus himself will come back and sit on the throne of David. So let's go forward here now. We are in the, uh, this is the resurrection. Uh, we see Jesus appears to his disciples, 500, and uh, we see that uh, he gives, this is 40 days of instruction. Uh, we see that first day was Sunday, he saw the two men on the Emmaus Road, that these were disciples. And uh, later in the day, at evening, he was with the apostles in the upper room. And uh, this was in the evening time, uh, three to six time frame. And uh, you can see that, uh, you know, all of a sudden he appeared in the room, but you know, they were having their church service. The next time you see Jesus with them is one week later. He says, on the first day of the week. What's the seventh day of the week for, to the Jews? Saturday. <clears throat> this was Sunday. The first day of the week was Sunday. So you have to, and sometimes you'll say it's the eighth day. Well, seventh day, Saturday, so the eighth day would be Sunday. This could be the first day, or uh, you can see how all that works out and be able to state what days. But it was a continuation of uh, meeting with them on, the, uh, on Sunday. So, again, what was he teaching in this time? Uh, <laughs> He had five messages that were very important. And uh, if we look at, could you get that? I can't get it. Okay. Um, I hope you can kind of see this, but you might get the gist of, of what it is as I, I discuss it here. But this is a great commission. This is uh, Luke. He says, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, a lot of people, you ask them, where's the Great Commission? They'll say, oh, Matthew 20, uh, 28, 19. So let's go to Matthew 28, 19. These scriptures I'm, I'm going to point out here are going to be very, very important for you because Jesus... Uh, 
is, uh, or I should say, these are the go ye scriptures. Now, some people have uh, versions of the Bible and oftentimes they're not going to say go ye because they're, they're smart and they say, well, we're going to take out all the ye's and these and, and, and make it easier, easy, easy English. Well, uh, the ones who made the King James Bible were the most English literate people in the world. <laughs> I mean, there's none like them. And if they put a ye in there, it was for a purpose. Now, uh, if Jesus says, go you into the world, and he's talking to the apostles, that's who he was talking to. But actually, in one place, they believe that that's where the 500 were uh, in one place. And uh, he would have been saying, go you 500. And it would all died out when all of them died. But that's not what he was saying. He says, go ye. Ye is a plural word. It meant everybody. Go ye is me. <laughs> go ye is each one of us. Go ye is everyone in, in, in God's church. He's telling us these things. We need to know these because uh, actually in Matthew he says, make sure they obey all the commandments. Make sure they observe all the commandments. These are the most important. I mean, he doesn't mention anything else here as far as commandments. What he's mentioning right here is go ye and reach me. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. I'm asking you to do the same thing. You're my representatives. You're going to carry my name. You're going to uh, bear my spirit within you. I'm going to be there with you. You're not going by yourself. And uh, you have to go ye and reach the world. So let's take a look at Matthew 28, 19. And you see that it says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's why it says, teaching them to observe all things. Notice that the word teach was used twice. And what, what I've done right here is, I've got the word teach right here, and it's used twice in Matthew. And go ye is once. It says, uh, uh, go ye therefore. And then nothing about believing, nothing about repentance, but it says uh, uh, baptism. It talks about uh, baptizing. And then it talks about uh, in the name. The name is mentioned. Then titles are mentioned, Father, Son, Holy Ghost are mentioned. And uh, one other thing, observe, and, uh, observe all things I have commanded. And he was telling them, we've got to teach new people coming to church and get them to obey all that he has commanded. And uh, how many commandments are there? Too many to count. Yeah, too many to count. We can start with the Old Testament. Uh, there was 10 there, but... Uh, I mean, right here we're getting the commandment. A lot of people don't realize this is a commandment. And he says, make sure they observe it. You know? Uh, five times, the end of Matthew, and then Mark, the end of Luke, the end of John, beginning of the book of Acts, he's saying, go ye, go ye. Why don't people go ye? Because that's only for preachers. It, they think it's only for preachers, but he was talking to each one of us, and me too. Okay, now let's look at this. Uh, one thing is they were using the scripture, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He's, he was telling them to go and baptize in the name. And instead of doing what he told them to do, they didn't observe that. They never used the name. Many, many churches today say, uh, they repeat the command, uh, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, name not mentioned. Well, it's not observed. They didn't do what they were supposed to. The people never got the name of Jesus put on them. Now, uh, we look at uh, what he was telling them. He was, he was telling them, you've got to make disciples. And he was telling them, teaching's a very important part of, of making disciples. And in another place, he talks about preach to them. 
everybody's not a preacher, but we can all do some teaching. Uh, everybody better be a teacher. They're at every level of the gift ministry. If parents can't teach, I'd hate to see their children. <laughs> That's just at a natural level. So we go now to the next one here is Mark. Let's take a look at Mark. Mark 16. And he starts out in verse 15, uh, 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye, go ye, there's a go ye, into all the world and preach. And so in this one, I, wherever preaching is here, I've, I've put down preaching under Mark, okay? Uh, into all the world and preach the gospel to every cr creature. He's saying, preach the gospel. You know, Mark's an interesting book. It starts off, uh, everybody said, well, you're supposed to believe in Jesus, okay? So when the first thing Jesus says in Mark 1, 14, 15 is, he says, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and obey the gospel. Whoa. No, excuse me, he didn't say that. He says, repent and believe the gospel. Okay? Well, I thought we were supposed to believe in Jesus, and Jesus himself is saying, repent and believe the gospel. We better know what that gospel is because that's the plan of salvation. We've got to know what that is to be able to tell other people how to be saved. Okay, now we go at, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. A lot of people that say all you have to do is believe, they don't like that scripture. Because uh, it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now if you don't believe, but a lot of people believe and don't do anything. They have a concept that mental assent. I believe, I've done it all. No, it says, you got to believe and be baptized. There's more to it. And then we go on, these signs shall follow them to believe. Now, in my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Wait a minute. It says, these signs will follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. Does that say some will? Or does it speaking to go ye? He's speaking to everybody. These signs shall fall. This is the first time speaking in tongues is mentioned in the New Testament. It's mentioned 25 times. Uh, the first time, they that believe shall speak in other tongues. The last time is forbidden not to speak in tongues. Uh, there are 10 scriptures on communion. There's seven scriptures on singing. Churches today will have communion in their church and they'll have singing. 25 scriptures on speaking in tongues, but they, they were not allowed to speak in tongues. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay. Um, they shall take up serpents. If they drink any day, deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall not recover. Of course, taking up servant, serpents, he says, we're going to crutch the head of serpents. And, and there are some crazy churches that pick up serpents, and, and uh, you don't tempt God, okay? <laughs> uh, why does it say we can't know? What? How does it say we can't know? It, 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 spiritually speaking, we can go against anything. <coughs> and uh, I remember years ago, I had a, we were out witnessing on a Saturday, and we had to go in some backwoods and got to this place, and it was just, I mean, dirty, filthy. And they said, come on in, have some coffee. <laughs> and roaches flying everywhere and all that. <laughs> and, 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 and Paul was all things to all people, and so he says, well, in Jesus' name, you know, and we drank that coffee, but we were able to touch the, their lives and help those people. I still remember that. It's, uh, that was the ones that had all those bamboos in their yard, and the bamboos were starting to come up to the house because bamboos, you plant them, and they take over, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, nevertheless, a sidetrack story. Um, let's go on to Luke. Uh, Mark, again, I marked the different things for him, but let's go to Luke. Luke 24. And um, this was just after he had been on the Emmaus Road with the disciples there. And after he had spoke to them, <coughs> it says it opened up their understanding. Well, what opened up their understanding? Jesus went back to the law and the prophets and the Psalms. 
And the law, well, that would have, what's the most important part of the law? It would have been a, the Ten Commandments. No, the most important part of the law was the ceremonial law. That took up most of the Old Testament. That takes up a lot of the New Testament, the ceremonial law. That was the sacrifices that were being made. And he says, look at this. That was me. Look at this. Everything in the tabernacle points to Jesus, and he was able to point all that out. And it opened up their understanding. Now we get into the upper room, verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Uh, law, prophets, and Psalms. It was basically the Old Testament. And then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Again, it opened up the apostles. They had been frightened. They had been scared. They ran when he was on the cross. All of a sudden, he walks into the room with them. And he, he, he starts talking to them. He got out his search for truth chart, and he starts going through the law and the prophets. And, and then the next thing you know is, is um, it, it says here that he opened up their understanding. There's a lot that we can learn in the Old Testament, especially with the tabernacle plan. And if you get an understanding, I, I look at the tabernacle as being the foundation of the whole Bible. Because on Mount Sinai, we saw how ugly sin was and what God wanted to do with sin, with the darkness, the flames, the earthquake, the uh, tempest, the, uh, all the lightning, the thunder, everything. I mean, it was a, a earthquake, it was a scary event, but then he turned around and he, he says, do not, do not, do not. And he was telling them, you're sinners. But then he says, he gave them another part of the law, and that was the tabernacle plan. And he says, but I've got a plan where you can get back into my presence again. Mm -hmm. And uh, he opened their understanding. Thus is written, and thus it behooved Christ the sovereign to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. He says, preach it in my name. Uh, repentance and remission. What's remission of sins? Remo removal. Removal? Yeah, but where does that take place? Baptism. Yeah. Baptism. yeah, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. He was saying baptism is where the remission of sins. That's important because especially when we get into John, we're gonna see there again that uh, we have to have this understanding of what remission's all about because he uses that in his go ye, okay? Now, um, and behold, I send a promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem. Okay, he's saying you've got to wait in Jerusalem to get the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very important statement here because the Holy Ghost had not yet been given. Uh, no one had spoken tongues yet. But he was saying, I want you all to wait in Jerusalem. So now we look at, in Luke, we can see the different things that were common with him. Now I'm going to just sum it all up over here. But let's go to John. And actually, the last chapter of John was kind of a special go ye to just Peter. And how bad Peter had failed God? I mean, how would you like to be Peter? And uh, he had just denied and cursed God. And I mean, it could have been any worse, you know, denied him. And as soon as he did, uh, I can't remember, his, uh, two times or three times, or whatever it was, uh, uh, the cock crowed, and the Bible says, Jesus stopped. They were taking him from one place to another. He stopped and looked at Peter. and Peter just, I mean, it all hit him right there. And he says, I failed. I was, I've lost. I, I, you know, everything that I'd, I was hoping for and everything, I, I failed my God. And, and you think, uh, how do you like to have been him? And, <laughs> but when Jesus comes back, he comes special to him. And he, he says, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. You, you love me? Feed my lambs. You know? And I mean, three times he's saying this because he, he was saying, you, you think you're a sinner. You think you've messed up, but i got faith in you. <laughs> I believe you're going to do it. Hear what I'm saying. I want you to go ye. 
And of course, Peter did go ye. <laughs> and uh, of course, tradition says that he was uh, crucified upside down. He says, I'm not, I don't deserve to be crucified like my, my God did. I'm crucifying me upside down. But he took a martyr's death. Everyone except John took a martyr's death. Now, what does that say about the apostles? If they did not believe that he was real, would they have taken that martyr's death? That's just another proof that... Right, right. <laughs> so, uh, again, uh, what we're looking at here is, let's back up to John 20. And we see John 21. Uh, then, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. And this is the same thing that Luke mentioned in his. He says he started out, Peace be unto you. So Luke and John are actually talking about the same situation. But uh, peace be unto you as my Father had sent me, even so send I you. There's your go ye. He said, I'm sending you, okay? Uh, and when he had said this, he breathed on them. He's speaking just to the apostles right now, okay? And when he said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So it's like you're the apostles and Jesus would have gone like this. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now the question is, did they receive the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Or what did they receive? And then it goes on. Now this is what I was telling you about our remission here is that whatsoever sins he remit, they're remitted unto them, and whatsoever sins he retained, they are retained. There's that remission. What does that mean? Okay, let's first of all look at the fact that uh, this is complementary with Luke. Luke and John were kind of on the same uh, piece be unto you, and they spoke it different, and he's speaking just to the apostles right now, but uh, he is also telling them that uh, receive ye the Holy Ghost. They did not receive the Holy Ghost here. The, uh, what did they receive? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and in Luke's account, uh, the same thing. He says, go to Jerusalem and receive the Holy Ghost. So we look at, uh, this was a special outpouring um, by God on the apostles, it was like a, a special anointing on them. But it, it wasn't when they received the Holy Ghost because Thomas was missing from this. All, all 11 of them, Judas was gone already, but uh, that would, there was only 10. One was missing, Thomas was missing. So it wasn't given to all of them. And uh, if we look at, someone go to John 7, 38, 39 and read that for me. Yes. He that believeth on me, as the scripture have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay. The Holy Ghost had not yet been given because Jesus hadn't been glorified. Where is the glorification? We're going to find out that the glorification takes place when he ascends up into heaven, and that hasn't taken place yet. So uh, once he's glorified, then he says, go to Jerusalem, and you'll be endued with power from my high. So uh, again, that's all future tense. The, uh, he was still with them. Jesus breathing on his disciples has been called the breath of promise a special blessing to tide them over until Pentecost and to encourage them to go on to Pentecost. So he was saying, receive the Holy Ghost. It was like, this is a command. It's a prophetic command. You've got to have the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, go and receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, and it wasn't receive it right now and the breathing on him. He was going back to uh, Adam. He breathed into him and gave him life. He didn't breathe into them, he breathed on them. Uh, he wasn't, the Holy Ghost is gonna come inside us. 
There was another breath that was taking place in the time of Ezekiel when he was saw the, all the uh, bones come back to life. And, uh, and, and so that expression was used. And uh, it, it has to do with the fact that there's a, a breath of life. Um, on the John 3, 3 to 15, we actually see Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And let, let's just go there real quick. This is all in the book of John here. But Nicodemus came to him and saying, what should I do? And he says, well, you've got to be born again. And in John 3, 3, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's talking about something born of the spirit, but notice what he says now. Marvel not, I said unto thee, ye must be born again. That which the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. Thou canst not, when it cometh, and whither it goeth, so everyone that is born in the Spirit. He's going to say, there's going to be something that you can hear. And uh, so we look at this, that uh, was anything heard here? Was there any wind, the sound of a wind? No, nothing like that happened here. Did that happen on the day of Pentecost? Absolutely. There was a sound of a rushing mighty wind that filled the house where they were sitting. And they all spoke, uh, who is it? Peter Slater says, we both uh, heard and saw what was taking place there. We heard and saw it, that something mighty and powerful was taking place. So uh, again, uh, in order for to get the Holy Ghost, there has to be a sound heard. Acts 5.32 says, The Holy Ghost is given to them that obey Him. It is not a special blessing on a few, but evidence of true belief. Uh, you have got to have the Holy Ghost. Uh, I read Romans 8, 9, and that was a, when I first came to church, read the Bible for the first time, get to Romans 8, 9, it says, if ye have not the Spirit of God, you are none of His. Ooh, that was scary. <laughs> we've got to have the Holy Ghost. And once we get the Holy Ghost, we've got to keep the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something more too, that when you get into the book of Acts, you will see that some of the apostles, disciples are doing mighty things, okay? And you look at them and, and you always read something into it here because it says they were full of the Holy Ghost and this person was healed. Or they, it would say they were filled with the Holy Ghost and this happened to this person. So it's saying that, first of all, it's saying that you can be half full, you can be a quarter full. <laughs> uh, yes. If you've spoken tongues, you've got the Holy Ghost, but are you a quarter, half, three-fourths, how much? But you look at their lives and you can see that they had prayer lives. And the basis of prayer is repentance. They were repenting daily, keeping the Holy Ghost within them alive. And uh, Jesus, when he died on the cross, the veil of his flesh was rent in twain and his spirit was released. And it comes into whomsoever will. When I received the Holy Ghost, I received him in me. But now, if I can ever get to the point where Roger can die out to himself enough, people won't look at me. The veil of my flesh will be so broken, so torn, that they'll see Jesus in me. And wouldn't it be called, wouldn't it be great if some, you're a Christian. You're acting like a Christian. You do Christian things. And that, they would say, you're a Christian. They would say, you're a school zoologic. No, you're a Christian. So that's what I want to hear, okay? Uh, it makes a difference. Uh, also in John 20, there's no evidence of anything miraculous, extraordinary, any increase in intensity or excitement. For example, joy, happiness occurred. Peter is a good example of the lack of change in their lives after this event. He continued in his way, went fishing, 
He was naked on a boat, led a crowd to draw straws to pick an apostle. Uh, he, he was out there, okay? So, you know, Jesus come back and he was, he was reaching for him specially, but he didn't have the Holy Ghost yet. But this coward on the day of Pentecost, he received the Holy Ghost, 120 upper room, he stood up and he commenced to tell all the Jews that were in Jerusalem, he says, that man that you murdered, he called them murderers. That was both Lord, Lord means Jehovah and Christ, the Messiah. You murdered him. He went the same man. We could tell Peter was a different man. The Holy Ghost in him was now alive, making him alive. Um, okay, I, th I think, I, again, it's uh, the tongues of fire and wind were significant on the day of Pentecost of the prophetic fire and wind of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai and the coupling of John 3, 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, nor whether it goeth. So as everyone is born of the Spirit, with Hebrews 12, 18, for ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempt us. I'm talking about Mount Sinai. Uh, it's talking about, uh, this is, what we're talking about Mount Moriah where God was able to give us something. Uh, at Mount Sinai, 3,000 were killed. At the Pentecost, 3,000 were saved that day. Uh, again, showing the relationship there. Uh, remission. <laughs> okay, what were they saying there? There's some uh, people that will tell you that they have the ability to remit sins. Nope. Nobody has that ability. Only God. But we've already stated remission is baptism. So uh, let, let's take a look at that and see what it says there. It says, Whosoever sins he remit, they remitted unto them. If I should baptize somebody, or if he, a person, I'll just say, if a person gets baptized, their sins are remitted. And then it goes on, whosoever sins he retained, they are not retained. Uh, I had a chance to baptize someone, I didn't baptize someone. They retained their sins. Woe on me. <laughs> woe, woe is I, or however you say it. Uh, it has to do with... We've got to win souls, and we've got to get them baptized. That's step one. Um, well, it's a basic step. Now, uh, know, too, that there's two baptisms that make one baptism. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And there's a baptism of water, and there's a baptism of spirit. John the Baptist says, There's one among you whom you know not, whose shoe latches I'm not uh, worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There's the spirit baptism. And of course, John was baptized in the water. Later, Jesus was telling us we have to baptize in the name of Jesus and get the name of Jesus placed on them. It's now 8.33, so my time is up. And so <laughs> I try to end at 8.30 each time. So we thank you, Lord, for being with us, talking to us, helping us, Lord, to understand you better to, so that we, each of us can come closer to you. So each of us can understand what happened here at, with this great commission, how we have to reach for people. And we're gonna see it next week, but we're gonna see how the apostles did exactly as Jesus said. But help us to be like them, Lord. Help us to get in the book of Acts and understand that book too. We love you, we praise you forever and ever, amen. Tremendous lesson in the